know. Oh, I'm not live yet. Do you want to go live? Just saw that. Woo! -hoo! Super fun. I can talk while you set up. Hi, world. <laughs> but that also means that you'll have to explain the cast again. <laughs> I'm sure. <laughs> you can't hear Mike. All right. That's my fault. Let's do... Oh, this is why. Let me know if that's any better, Blake. Say hi, Mike. I'm just being a jerk. <laughs> I was going to say, you, gotta, you have to say something before they can tell if you're <laughs> talking. Yeah. Thanks true. for that. <laughs> uh. All right. Blake, any better? He's calling me a jerk, so yes. <laughs> Makes it very fun for the guy running like the tech side of it. <laughs> yep, yep. Awesome. Uh well I'll Tell the story again then. Uh, yeah, it's on my non-fountain pen side. That is correct, Blake. But writing with a fountain pen is basically the only thing that hasn't been affected. <laughs> it's amazing how much you need your non-dominant hand for. <laughs> Things like tying shoes and flossing your teeth are insanely hard. <laughs> but um, yeah, I broke it, jammed it, playing basketball my eighth grade son's team and uh, instead of jamming it i broke it in two places so i got a cast on it could have been a lot worse actually no surgery needed no screws or anything so uh tomorrow i go back to the doctor they take a look at it hopefully then i can have a splint instead of a cast but hopefully yeah so i'm wearing i'm wearing this uh plaid shirt because I can't wear any long sleeve shirts that don't have these buttons that you can undo to get my hand through. So my bookworm sweatshirt, for example, can't wear it right now. Sad face. I hope you're all enjoying yours. I know Josh just bought one. So I will be warm vicariously through you all. <laughs> Blake has a good point. I forgot Sparky always dictates his articles. Like he any writing. Yeah, he's he been trying it. to he's been trying to get me to do that. Uh doesn't work for me. Typing actually isn't that bad. Uh it's just took a little while to get used to because I would go to hit it. Like I have the muscle memory in like my third finger specifically. And then I like feel like I pressed the key, but I didn't. So a lot of my words are just like missing a letter. <laughs> <laughs> That's fun. <laughs> Yeah. Huh. Don't do that. <laughs> oh, well. Yep. <clears throat> Don't do that indeed. Lesson learned. Don't break hands. All right. I'll do my best not to. Though I tried to. Did I tell you about my wrist? The whole twisting it mm -mm. electrical thing? I Way back when we first started our house project, I was bearing down on a corded drill, trying to drill a hole to put electrical wire through it. But the house was hand-framed with, like, the hand-hewn lumber, which is, like, 100-year-old okay. fir trees is what it was used, it seems like, or oak in some cases. I've got some old-growth oak in the framing of our house, and I was trying to drill a hole in it. That wood doesn't like to have holes drilled in it, and it bound <laughs> up on the drill, and it twisted my arm up and under, and pinned Ouch. it against the joist that was next to the one I was working on, but it pinned my finger on the trigger, and I couldn't get it off. And the only way to get my arm and everything loose was to hit it with my other hand, which happened to have a hammer in it, 
Thankfully, I didn't use the actual head of the hammer to do that. But I had to do that in order to break it all loose in order to get my hand off the trigger and get it out. And to this day, my wrist is still kind of tweaked because of it because I either tore something in it or I haven't done anything about it. And it's been since mm. early July that I did that. But I don't want to go to the doctor because doctors today are less than fun to be going <laughs> to see. So there's that. Tell me about it. <laughs> I'm sure you know that very well right now. Oh, we we had uh, we had this thing the other day. Not the other day. It's probably about a month ago at this point. All of my kids had this cold, where especially the little ones, they get like this croup type cough. We know exactly what it is. No fever, nothing else. They feel fine. They just are coughing at night. Yep. And uh, so Adelaide seems to be the most affected by this. And she like, at one point, um, stopped breathing, not recently, it was a couple of years ago, stopped breathing. We had to call the ambulance cause, um, just her passageway is like not as free, I guess. So we call the doctor like, Hey, can we get, uh, antibiotic for this? We know exactly what this is. We've had all of our kids multiple times. And, uh, the person we talked to is like, Oh, anything respiratory, you got to go into the ER. <laughs> We're like, we're not going into the ER. <laughs> this is like a very, very mild cold. Let us talk to Dr. Hunt. It's our pediatrician. Yeah. Unfortunately, we were able to get a hold of her and she's like, Oh yeah, don't don't do that. Just here. Here's the prescription. <laughs> go go do what you do, you know? <laughs> yes. You guys know what you're talking about. And it's been around the yeah. around the block. But the times. default the default was always, you know, well, anything respiratory now, you gotta take them to the ER. Yeah. You can't go to urgent care, you can't go anywhere else because hashtag COVID. Yep. Like it's not COVID. It's this stupid little cough thing they got, you know, from all the kids in their their class. It's going around the schools. Everybody around here has it. We just want the antibiotic. No, no you we gotta go. What'll take care of it. Yep. Ah <laughs> <laughs> Every Tool a Hammer by Adam Savage. I'll write that down. That sounds like my my kind of book. <laughs> not set up to take notes yet. What is that all about? Every tool a hammer, Adam Savage. He's he's a fascinating guy. I saw a video once that he he was I don't know if he still is or not, but at the time he was a huge Evernote fan. I did not realize that, <laughs> but he has terabytes and terabytes. What did he say? Like over a hundred terabytes worth of data that he has saved onto his hard drives of just research that he does. It was nuts. <laughs> but the whole thing was centered around Evernote, it sounded like. Super fun. Anyway, we should record so you can do your thing later. We should record a podcast. <clears throat> uh, now, this is the tricky part. I got to press two buttons at the same time with one hand. <laughs> that sounds fun. I generally I think just I got press it. the one and then I do the others shortly after. That's what I do. I think I, I, think I got it. If... Uh, I, if you lose my video and you hear a big crashing sound, it's because my cast knocks stuff off my desk. But Well, don't do that. <laughs> I'll try not to. <laughs> okay. Ready to count down? Yep. All right. Three, two, one. Have you ever read a productivity book? From around the turn of the century, Mike, as in the 20th century, not the 21st. Actually, I have. Uh, so have you, I believe. Before, wasn't, uh, think, before think the last two rich. weeks, maybe I should do that. Was Think and Grow yeah, Rich in that time frame? I'm pretty sure Think and Grow Rich is pretty old. I don't remember exactly, but I know it's public domain now, which is why there's 20 different publications of it, it on Amazon. That makes sense. Yeah, I didn't realize that one was from that far back. However, our book for today is that, but we can't go there yet because Not quite. I'm jumping ahead. I'm apparently itching to get to this, uh, but we have some follow-up to do first, and I've got a couple of them that I can talk about here, and then I think you've got a couple as well. Uh, one of those, mm -hmm. these both come from reading John Acuff's soundtracks, and the first of those was just starting to notice 
the wrong soundtracks that I have in my head that I need to flip. And I've started paying attention to those and just trying to be aware of when am I telling myself something repeatedly? That happens all the time. And it's obnoxious once you start paying attention to it. And I can't quite tell <laughs> if I'm very happy to have read this John Acuff book or if I'm really angry with John Acuff right now. I can't quite nail down <laughs> where I'm sitting on this because I don't think I wanted to know quite so much about how my brain thinks in bad ways. <laughs> so it happens a lot. I'm not very good at flipping things yet, but it does happen a lot. That's that's the uh, the double edged sword, right? Of yes. uh, productivity in general, is you want to do better, but in order to do better, you got to realize how much you suck. <laughs> yes, yes. So anyway, I I will continue working on that one. That's one of those like, how on earth do you hold me accountable to this? But it's fascinating. If you don't do this, just start paying attention to the repetitive thoughts you tell yourself. It's obnoxious. Welcome to my so torture. <laughs> on this this topic, by the way, I think our next book is going to uh, bring some interesting perspective to this. I'm not sure if you've started it yet. I have. Uh, I have not. This should be a fun conversation at the very least. Huh. All right. Well, that one I know I've been like itching to get to it. My plan is to start it tonight, so... I don't know. <laughs> now you've got me nervous about it. <laughs> I thought I had some preconceived notions on it. Now I probably uh, don't. It's, it's, it's going to be good. So uh, get your popcorn ready, everybody. Join us next time for sure. <laughs> All right. Well, my first maybe one... the most volatile conversation in bookworm history. Really? That's that's a bold claim. Like we're talking Amanda Palmer level. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Uh, well, so the basic idea of the book challenges everything that we hold to be true in the productivity space, I feel. There's going to be some real uncomfortable questions that we have to ask, and I'm really looking forward to the conversation that results. <laughs> you know, if it, if it runs counter to a lot of what we talk about in self-help and productivity, like you're saying, if it runs counter to that, I'm probably going to have one of two reactions, either yes or I don't like you, Mr. Berkman. Like, stop it. <laughs> so yeah, or both. I could see that. Or both, yes. <laughs> that would be even worse, I think. All right, so notice the bad soundtracks in your head. And it sounds like we may reconsider more of those soundtracks next time. Uh, but the other one was to consider some of the symbols that I have uh, around me physically. And I've been gone in a way, and we had to put off our recording this time because... We had a whole COVID potential in our household. Turned out negative, but we had that potential, and I had to put this off. Anyway, all that to say, I haven't really been around my office, like, really at all since we last recorded. <laughs> so there's that part, at least. But I have at least thought through some of this, and I've realized, like, I have a bank of symbols already here. I just haven't associated, like, a soundtrack with those, to use the John Acuff terms. Some of those are like, I've got always got a pile of books on my desk. Like That can be a symbol in itself. Uh, I have a John Deere coffee mug here that I use for tea nowadays, uh, which is primarily because a couple of my office mates are Case IH fans, and they need, they need to be reprimanded and shown the truth <laughs> for all my farm friends out there. So anyway, like I have some of these things that I'm starting to realize I already have in place. Uh, so I don't know what's going to come of this, but I think it's at least an interesting exercise to just pay attention to what those are. Like, I know you have quite a bit on your desk, actually, that, that kind of fits this bill, I'm guessing. Um, oh, but yeah, yeah that's, that's, that's where I'm at with it. Just trying to be aware of what I currently have and then trying to associate, like, what are the soundtracks that I'm wanting to promote? I don't even know what that would be that I would talk about here, but what are those soundtracks that I want to encourage in myself? And is there a symbol that could be associated with those? So I've been going through that process. Again, this is one I don't know how to say is done, but it's one that I'm at least aware of. So that's what I'm going through. Cool. Power to the symbols. Woo! You? 
So I have two action items here. One is to identify my turndown techniques, which this was an idea of when you have those negative soundtracks that are blaring, how do you turn them down with the dial? Because you can't just switch them off. And uh, I did identify a bunch of these. Most of them have to do with some form of physical exercise, which makes it incredibly unfortunate timing that I just <laughs> broke my hand and can't do any of them. <laughs> nice. Well done. <laughs> yeah. So this action item kind of backfired. It made me frustrated that I couldn't use any of my turndown techniques. Okay. But did you No, there there were some other ones there too, but I was gonna say, did you figure out like an alternative turndown to exercise? Yeah, well, I made a big list of them actually. Okay. And uh it's not any one that I use every single time. It's just kind of a grab bag I go to and then whichever one I feel like in the moment is the one that I use. So included in there are uh, go for a run, go for a bike ride, and go to the gym. Those are the three exercise ones, which I can't do any of those at the moment. Uh, and then there's meditate, there's journal, there's play video games. Uh, and then the other one I thought of kind of leads itself into the next action item, which is to create, uh, for lack of a better term, an MOC inside of Obsidian. I know you don't like that term. We talked about that last time. You really like the the map idea instead of the content idea. But basically identifying the turndown technique here, this is a negative soundtrack I'm listening to over and over again. So instead of just accepting all the generalities of this negative soundtrack being true, let's just get it on paper and let's actually name this thing. It's kind of like a fear setting sort of exercise, except I'm not going that far with it. It's just getting it down. And then once you see it, you're like, oh, well, that's really not that bad. <laughs> Plus you uh, have all these other techniques for dealing with the information as it's in front of you where uh, like I'm doing this uh, as we record this, a workshop with Nick Milo uh, shortly. It'll have happened already by the time this goes live, but it's on sense making. And so it's essentially like when, you ask the right, right questions, the answers become clear. So we want to help people give them some questions they can ask to help sort through what what uh, they're thinking about a specific thing. I like that term sense-making. It's basically just uh, defining something and bringing meaning to it. So I'm trying to do that more in Obsidian. That's What's that, that quote that I heard from you first? Thoughts disentangle themselves through lips and pencil tips? Yep. Well, for me, also through clicky keyboards, <laughs> even if I have to use just a few fingers to do it. <laughs> I don't remember the source of that quote, but I know that it was like it's old. So it's like pre typewriter that that comes from. So I'm, I would guess wherever that came from, it would probably translate to clicky keyboards, but yeah, not I membrane it... keyboards. And thinking does not work on membrane keyboards <laughs> at all. It's true. It's true. So yeah, the whole idea behind sense making is I have this problem, help me come up with some interesting solutions. And so my other action item is, am I focusing on the problem or the solution? I tend to get stuck on the problem, but if I build the MOC in Obsidian and I go through the process and I ask the questions, I start with the problem but by the end of it, I'm forced to be thinking about the solution. So kind of the trick here for me is to catch myself being stuck on the problem. And at that point, okay, let's just dump it into Obsidian and see where it goes. And the moment that I start that process, I've got enough momentum to actually get to some solutions, even if they're not great ones and they're not going to be implemented right away. It at least gets me moving in the right direction. Makes sense. So more obsidian time. Is that what I'm hearing? Absolutely. I suppose that's not bad. I've been doing more in it lately, which I wasn't expecting. But Joe always moves from thing to thing. So anyway, that's all You're, our follow-up. You're uh, wearing the, the obsidian outfit today. <laughs> Purple didn't, shirt. Didn't even know that. <laughs> <laughs> I think of, see that, that, it's fascinating you say that because in my head, obsidian is blue. But it's because of the theme I use in Obsidian. 
<laughs> so ah, like in okay. my head, Obsidian is blue and everything, like all on like the stream deck and everything, whenever I've got any form of icon or shortcut or something that goes into Obsidian, it's always blue. So, so my you must head be using the minimal theme. Uh, it's a custom theme. I wrote it. Oh, okay. So I don't think it exists <laughs> right. anywhere. Not that I'm aware of. I know that I started with some other theme and then rewrote most of it. So I don't even know what it is, what it would be similar to. But I don't know. I like blue, but I'm wearing purple today. <laughs> Maybe that's why I liked your shirt earlier. But <laughs> <laughs> all right. All that aside, let's step into today's book because I'm super excited about going through a really, really old self-help book and Blake helped us out in the chat he said think and grow rich is from 1937 this so not one, quite as old as this one this one was originally published so this is self-control it's kingship and majesty this is by William George Jordan and this was originally published in 1907 and it's technically considered a religious book and, and he classified it as a religious book having read it like i i get how they say that but at the same time it's like i religion and christianity is not talked about a ton in this it's kind of an assumed thing but i also realized that if you think about 1907 and culture and society at the time it was mostly a christian society at the time at least that's the way people refer to it I wouldn't know. I wasn't there. So I can't <laughs> can't confirm nor deny that claim, but I know that around that time period like there was a lot like the the assumption was everybody went to church, right? So a lot of what's talked about here would probably be seen through the lens of the Bible whether or not it was written with that intent or not. It wouldn't have to be explicit. Uh which in this case kind of is an interesting way for us to dive into this because I know that we can compare this to a lot of more like more modern books because this one I was shocked at how dense it was it's just over 100 pages what is that 120 no not even 116 pages is the one I've got I know there's a bunch of different renditions of it but 116 pages but I feel like this could have easily been a 250 page book for sure but I, I also know that whenever I've read some of the reviews and intros and stuff, like this is one that's considered one of the books that started off the whole self-help category because it didn't used to be a thing. And this is one that kind of set that off and, and made it into a, a, a category. Now, it didn't do that single-handedly. It was just one of the books that did that or, or helped that process. So anyway, it's an interesting one to to go through, I think. Agreed. And uh, if you are put off by the religious text, uh, I think just listen to the episode then instead of buying it yourself. But there really isn't a lot that's explicitly religious in here. There's a lot of really powerful ideas, which is one of the cool things about reading these older books is you you hear things that you've heard in other places, more contemporary, newer sources but usually by the time you hear those things in those newer books, it's like the telephone game and it's a pretty watered down version of the original. And so these older books tend to be a little bit more powerful, uh, my opinion, when we read them, because uh, it's this is fresh to this this writer as opposed to somebody who's just heard it from somebody who's heard it from somebody who's putting it in their book because they need to have it and they need to speak to this thing. But this is kind of like the original and it's the the better version of a, a lot of these ideas. There's also some stuff in here that I had not heard, at least in the way that it was presented, which I thought was pretty cool, which we'll get to when we go through this uh, this outline here. Yeah, for sure. This was this was an interesting read. Can considering like we've talked about this whole interconnectedness of books before, right? And when you have a book like this that predates a lot of the other books that you've read, it gets to be a little, at least in my head, it's a little backwards trying to piece it together because it's like, okay, we read an entire book on grit. 
if he mentions grit in here, which he doesn't specifically call out grit, but if he mentions grit, it's like, well, I've read a whole book on it, but he predates the whole book I read on it. So this would be like one of the sources for Angela Duckworth. So like that's a whole different way of thinking about it versus I read the older book and then here's a newer one that talks about it. So then you can reference the history of the one you're currently reading. It, it can be somewhat foundation shifting, I guess, when you do it the opposite direction like what we're doing here because you end up in a spot where this one could potentially have been the foundation for something you read later, but they may position it differently than what you read later. So then you like, okay, well, it, may, it changes your whole perspective on one you've already completed. That's what I'm getting at. That's kind of a weird way to say it. I think I came round and round and round in circles on that. All that to say, let's start. <laughs> uh, the Kingship of Self-Control is where he starts. That's the first chapter, which makes sense. It's kind of the summary of his book title here. But the thing you need to know is that there are 16 chapters in this book. This is before the time of doing three-part books. And it's 16 chapters, the first of which kind of introduct, introducts. It introduces, introducts, is that even a, maybe I just made up a word. It introduces the whole concept of self-control as the overarching uh, character trait, I guess, would be the term, that the rest of this book sits on top of. And if you look at each of the chapters, and we're not going to cover all of them just because it would just be too long, despite this being a short book. There are character traits that he covers and talks about in some fascinating ways, I found, throughout the rest of the book, but it's all based on top of this concept of the kingship of self-control. Thus, he starts there because the rest of them dictate that you have self-control over them, if you follow me there. So I found it a really interesting way to come at it, but he starts this by just talking about how like controlling yourself is the ultimate. Like that is where you need to start because if you don't control yourself, you're just being haphazard, you're following along with the crowd, and if you're following along with the crowd or following along with what you want and not you know, throwing caution to the wind, if you go down that path, obviously you end up in places you don't want to be and places that you shouldn't be. So that's, that's kind of the, the core setup for the whole book. Do you feel like I summarize this well? I feel like I'm trying to summarize the whole book when I shouldn't be. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I, I agree with you that at the beginning, he's defining self-control as the the primary thing here, which right away is going to be really polarizing because I think in our culture today, there is a large emphasis on things happening to you that aren't your fault. And I don't, I want to be careful how I describe this because I understand there's situations, some bad things happen to, to good people and they did nothing to invite it. Uh, but the truth is, re regardless of where you find yourself, whether you uh, created the situation or you just happen to find yourself in it, once it's over, you're left with a choice, which is continue to just respond to things that happen to you or take control, ownership, self-determination, decide for yourself that you are going to dictate the next move. And if I were to summarize self-control, that's basically what it is. He talks in this chapter about at each moment in a man's life, he's either king or slave. So if you're a king, you get to make all the rules. If you're a slave, you just do what you're told. <laughs> and that is a very depressing place to find yourself in. I feel like if you don't feel like you have any sort of influence on your future and all you can do is just try to hold on and, and survive. And uh, I've heard story after story of people who have been in those situations. I'm fortunate that I've never been there myself um, where you can feel sorry for yourself or you can grab a shovel and dig yourself out. And I feel like that's the single most important decision that you can make in your life is to decide that you may not be able to control everything, which uh, the next book specifically speaks to, <laughs> but you can control some things and uh, control what you can control, do the best with what you've got. 
Uh, maybe don't put all of the onus on the outcome, all the pressure for it to be good on your own shoulders. I think people can get discouraged w with that. But I guess if I were to give anybody any sort of advice or echo, like one idea from this entire book, it's right here at the very beginning, recognize that you have at least some influence on your future and how you manage yourself is going to be the way that you either end up there or not. And if you decide to create your own future, uh, do what you can to build your own future, you're going to do a better job of creating a good one than somebody else is going to do for you. Somebody once said, I forget the original source of the quote, but if you let others define your world, they'll always make it too small. So even if you have parents, loved ones who are on your side, they want to see you succeed, they are going to do everything in their power to help you be successful, they're still not able to help you reach your full potential. That's something that's only inside of you that you have to see and you have to tap into uh, in order for it to really come to, to reality. Until you do that, you're always going to be living at a level lower than what you're truly capable of. Sometimes I feel like it's hard to know what, what limits to put on or whether to put them on at all. Like what you're saying, like usually you have a lot more capabilities than what other people are going to assume of you. I, I definitely saw that in this big house project I've been in the midst of. I had multiple people tell me that they didn't know I was that handy at doing work on a house. It's like, well, well, I was somewhat, but not at that level. There's this really, really cool tool called YouTube that solves lots and lots of problems. And you can learn lots. And you can do significantly more than what you originally thought you could. And it amazes me. I, I'm always shocked at the number of people who don't realize that you can go learn new things. Like We come right back to Carol Dweck, mindset, growth mindset. I was just thinking that too, just yeah. Just shocked at the number of people who don't realize that they can improve. And I'm regularly told by folks, both in volunteer roles and leadership roles, like, you have to just accept me for who I am. This is just the way I am. Like, no, that's how you're choosing you don't to have be. To stay where you are. <laughs> yes, and it's it's so I find it kind of painful to listen to. It's like it doesn't have to be like that. Like you are choosing to make this hard for yourself, and it, it's hard to know how to help someone who's in that position because the foundation of their whole argument is flawed, but they don't feel like they can listen to an alternative to their foundation. That's that's what yeah. I really struggle with. And again, I run into this more often than I expect to, but you're absolutely right. You know, I had I had as you were talking, I was thinking about some of the Ryan Holiday stuff with stillness is the key, like you can't change what other people do, but you can change the way you react to it and staying calm and reacting to things without hurry and immediacy like that's usually the better route which we'll talk about here um, but anyway he starts this off with the kingship of self-control and then he steps right into the next chapter which is the crimes of the tongue and this is where you start the process of he, he takes different character traits and he goes one way or the other he either shows you the negative side of it or he shows you the positive side of it and i didn't really notice any <laughs> pattern here but I know that like he starts off with the crimes of the tongue, obviously the negative potential here, and he just talked about self-control, and I, I think he's absolutely spot on to start with your mouth and the way you talk and the words that you share with other people and how you can cause tons of damage with your words, way more damage with your words than what you can physically in any way, whether you realize that or not. And I think he nails that. That's absolutely true. I would definitely agree with that. But it also means there's a pretty big onus on us to have self-control over our tongue, to, to control what it is that we're saying. You and I probably do this more than we realize with podcasting for as many times as we share words uh, and try to be intentional with what we're sharing. But I know a lot of people who don't pay attention at all. It's like, come on, come on, at least... Don't repeat yourself over and over again. I do that sometimes, but you don't have to do it at that level. Anyway, watch your mouth. 
Yeah, especially interesting coming off the heels of soundtracks. And uh, for me, the the Gap book, which I will continue to reference, <laughs> The Power of Positive Thinking by Norman Vincent Peale. We're going to have to cover that one at some point. It's <laughs> such a good book. Uh, I think it needs... it. You have, you have to be in the right space in order to receive it. It's not not everybody can just pick up that one and and uh, think it's awesome like like I do. But for the right person in the right place, it is a, a very transformational book. I actually went to uh, Half Price Books and bought all four copies they had and intend to give them away as Christmas gifts. Nice, <laughs> nice. So that book, that's what this statement really triggered for me, this chapter. And uh, I don't have a whole lot of notes in this one, but I do think it is very powerful to think of uh, your tongue as a rudder it talks about in, in the book of James in the Bible and it controlling this, this large ship. And uh, I believe he references that in this book. I didn't write down the notes because I've got it other places. But when you think about it that way, you're steering either towards the right destination or you're getting off course and there's a danger that you're going to crash and burn. And I don't think it's an exaggeration to say the words that come out of your mouth will lead you to either the the good place or the bad place. <laughs> uh, we don't think of it that way. We think that they don't really, our words don't really have that big of an impact but the truth is that nothing is neutral. And so you're going one of two directions and um, there's, there's nothing idle. There shouldn't be anything wasted. I know it's kind of funny hearing that come from a podcaster, <laughs> but I, I really try to take this part seriously and, and try to be constructive and intentional and positive with my words. And I feel like I'm getting better at this. I still got a long ways to, to go, but also recognizing that the minute that you're going to start confessing all this positive stuff, you're going to start constructing this good future that you're moving towards everybody who doesn't have a revelation of what you are doing and why is going to start trying to pull you down. And they're just going to start saying these things and planting these thoughts like that doesn't work. This is hokey. You, what what are you doing? You're not going to get anywhere that way. And you have to be careful because if you listen to that stuff, you can sabotage yourself. It's like you, you plant seeds and then before they really have a chance to to grow into something and produce some fruit, people tell you, oh, you don't see anything above the surface. Obviously, that seed's not doing anything. That was a that was a bad seed. You know, that, that seed doesn't have any potential. It was dead before you put it in the ground. <laughs> well, I guess they're right. I may as well just dig it up now. And then you you sabotage your, your future. On page 25, he says, the man who stands above his fellows must expect to be the target for the envious arrows of their inferiority. I like that phrase. Uh, I feel it's going to be very divisive. Like the, the implicit in that statement is a ranking of people. <laughs> And I think you can uh, you can uh, apply that idea without taking it to that extreme. Uh, really, the big idea here is just worry about yourself and don't care what other people think. But uh, the real thing that this speaks to me is recognize that those challenges are going to happen. And they're going to come from maybe some unexpected sources. Like I was saying earlier, you have people who are close to you, want to help you succeed. Sometimes they're the worst because they care so much that they're trying to feed you their philosophy, their theology, and uh, it could be not the right thing for you. And as long as you continue to disagree with them, they're just going to get more vehement and more galvanized. You're, you're going to become their project, and every time they see you, they're going to try to convert you to their way of, of thinking. And uh, the best thing that you can do is not be affected by that stuff. Easier said than done, I know. But I've kind of also been through it myself where uh, you just have to learn to, okay, I hear you, but then not hang on to those things. Be quick to dismiss them and just go do your thing. I want to go back to, you talked about 
sharing books. You went and bought the four books you were going to give away as Christmas presents. I, I've been starting to notice this. If you give a book to somebody, this is off topic. If you give a book to somebody and they know that we run Bookworm, do you find that they tend to read it? Like a lot of times if you give a book to someone, they don't read it, right? But yep. if you have a podcast about nonfiction books, like I find that if I give a book, <laughs> I usually within about a month to two months have them come back and tell me what they thought about it because they actually read it. And I'm not used to seeing that. <laughs> so do you find that? I don't know. I don't know if there's some sort of clout that comes with having a podcast about nonfiction books. Uh, I don't know. I typically, the people that I know in real life, I don't ever talk about my internet life. <laughs> yes. I'm definitely like that. Yeah. So there's a few of them that I go to church with, for example, that do listen to bookworm and occasionally they'll say something. And every time they do, because of the context, real life context, I'm always caught off guard. I'm like, yep. whoa, you actually, <laughs> you actually listen? Exactly. Because <laughs> I just assume everybody that I know around here just is not interested and does not know anything about the podcasts or anything else that I do. Yep. Uh, so I don't, I don't go into it anticipating we're going to have a, a conversation. I, usually when I gift these books, it is because I've had a conversation with somebody about the book and I can tell they're interested in it. So it's almost like if I leave that conversation believing that they have a possibility of buying it for themselves, most people won't, but if they are even like hinting at that, I'll just buy it for them and give it to them. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, yes, that's definitely the way to go if you're able financially. Cause I know that They'll have a ten like they almost feel guilty if they don't read it if you gift it to them at, at like that in that scenario. Yes. Anyway, that was off topic. Uh, another chapter here I want to cover. At least Mike wants to cover. I didn't have it on the outline, but Mike wanted to add it. The red tape of duty, and I I didn't include this because like there's a lot of different ways that I feel like I could have taken this, and all of which are going to take a really long time to talk about. But the gist of it is like, we have a tendency to do things because we feel like we are supposed to do them. That's the concept of duty. And how sometimes that duty is actually nonsensical and not required <laughs> and actually does more harm than it should. But where did you want to take this, Mike? You, you you specifically called this one out, and quickly, too. I was surprised. Yeah, well, this chapter influenced me the most, I think, out of this entire book. Uh, I was brewing on this before we read it, to be honest. So this topic kind of helped me solidify my thoughts on these two concepts, duty versus love. And... Uh, Really, this started when I was putting together the newsletter. I have one called Quiet Strength, and I have a public link, so I'll put that in the show notes for people who want to read this. We talked a little bit about this. When we went through Courage is Calling, uh, we came upon the story of August Landmesser. You remember him? Yes. Yeah, I do remember that. Okay. So that's the guy with his arms crossed, and everyone around him is doing the Nazi salute. I dug into his story and turns out he was a car carrying Nazi because he thought it would be an inform somewhere, but then he fell in love with a Jewish woman. So the reason that he is standing there defiantly is not because he's going to stick it to Hitler, but because he's motivated by love. And so right away, this dichotomy of duty versus love, I really liked. And he defines duty here as looking at life as a debt to be paid it's forced like a pump and it's prescribed and formal. But love looks at life as a debt to be collected and it's spontaneous like a fountain. And uh, I was thinking on this and obviously the, the big action item from this, if you wanted to have one, is let your life be one that's motivated by love, not by duty. Because duty is only going to take you so far. Duty is like all of the rules and the regulations, which even for a systems person like me is great when it's convenient, but the minute that I don't want to do those things, then it falls down. 
whereas love goes beyond the rules. And there are so many areas of your life that this can apply to. The one he talks about specifically here, I think, is spiritual. He even says here, Christianity is the one religion that's based on love, not duty. So his words, not mine. But uh, I feel like that's a very important concept to apply, regardless of your religious affiliation, to any area of your life. If you really want to make a difference, then you have to have a mission that is bigger than yourself. Thinking back to like The Second Mountain by David Brooks. Right. You climb the first mountain. It's all about you, 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 you get to the top and you're like, is this it? And then you see the second mountain, which is the one about other people. And oh, I should have been climbing that one the whole time. So I've really been thinking about this and kind of challenging myself in every area of my life to let myself not be led by this is something on my list or an agreement that I made a long time ago. So I just got to follow through and I got to do it. But why did I sign up to do this thing in the first place? It's because I want to help other people. And that looks different when I'm leading a discipleship group or showing up to record a podcast or writing an article for the sweet setup or serving as an elder in my church. Like there's all sorts of different manifestations of this, but when you can boil it down to a love inspired motivation, it makes everything way more fun <laughs> and you don't, feel the pressure of, well, we didn't complete these three items on the checklist. You just do the best that you can with what you've got. You try to help as many people as you can. And then you walk away from it thinking, you know what? That was pretty awesome. Instead of being frustrated because you got 70% of your tasks done or whatever. That whole get all your tasks done thing. That I feel like it's dangerous you and I have both talked about task management for a long time. And when you feel like you have to finish your list, but then you make your list as you say, you're making your list today for I'm making it today for tomorrow's Joe, but today Joe doesn't know what tomorrow Joe is going to feel like. And I always have like this perfect ideal that I feel like tomorrow Joe can accomplish. And it never goes that way, but I feel like I have to complete that list, even though I didn't really consider what that list really contained. Like, yes, I may have 100 things on it, and even if I got 100 of them done, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's all the correct thing to get done. So I that that's a good way to put it, I think. Like, the whole duty of trying to get that done, check off the rules, check off the things, like, that's just not, it's not the way to do it. Anyway, it all comes down to the question of why, you know, and if there's something on your to-do list that you're hesitating to complete and you ask yourself why, and it's not in the, I almost said duty, but it's all, it's not in the, uh, the service inspired love motivated realm. It's almost like, well, what's the point? And that is very difficult for past me to accept because <laughs> in the past, I was very task oriented and I'm just going to get the thing done. Doesn't matter what the circumstances are. And I recognize that that approach, I could end up hurting people along the way, but Chris Bailey, right? The people are the reason for the productivity. And so if I'm in the service of other people, if I'm trying to do as much good as I can before I leave this earth, then I got to be willing to just chuck my plan entirely. If the person that I'm trying to serve really needs something that's not on the plan, I got to be willing to provide that and not the five things that I wanted to get done in the next couple of hours. I mean, any parent knows this. <laughs> if your kid is hurt, you got to take them to the emergency room to get, you know, get a cast, get stitches, whatever. It uh, doesn't matter what you had planned to do that day. That's more important. And so I'm trying to recognize the moments that are more important without having the disaster scenarios like that manifest. Anybody who has a brain cell in their head can identify the right action to do when your kid is bleeding, right? Take care of them. But a lot of the times people are hurting and it's not so obvious. So 
how do you recognize some of those things if they do a real good job of hiding them? You got to spend the time. You got to have the conversations. You got to dig a little bit deeper. It's not convenient, but it's the most important thing. Let's go on to the next one here, which is worry, the great American disease. And again, I find this fact, this was written in 1907. <laughs> this could have been written today, <laughs> right? <laughs> there's, yeah. there's a lot of this that I'm like, really? This is over 100 years old. Really? This is, this is like modern. <laughs> this is weird. But yes, uh, worry, the great American disease. One of the quotes he has towards the very beginning of this is, worry is the most popular form of suicide. And that one kind of took me back a little bit. I had to kind of process that one a little bit, Mike, just trying to figure out what does he mean by that. And thankfully, he spells it out a little bit. But you start thinking about this. How many things do you not do? You were just talking about duty and, and you know deciding what you should do and how do you help other people and such. What happens if you worry about how other people are going to react or what other people think about what would happen if you did do that thing? That might be a weird way to try to get your head around that. But if you can process that, if we worry about what other people are thinking of us, if we worry about... Uh, the results of our actions, we have a tendency to not do them at all. At least that's my tendency. And I will eventually just not do those things no matter what the potential result would be. And thus, I've done a disservice to those around me because I'm not following through on things that would be extremely helpful to them. So it's absolutely true. Worry is a huge <laughs> problem. And I love that he calls it the great American disease because I know that that's a very prominent thing in America, even today. So don't worry, Mike. It'll be okay. <laughs> you know, it's kind of interesting because uh, he says this is the great American disease. Americans, we tend to have this emphasis on our rugged individualism and we're a self-made man or woman and our success is completely attributed to ourselves, as we'll find in the next book. Maybe that's not entirely true, <laughs> but it also, I think, is um, very much linked to the previous chapter, which we didn't cover, chapter four, The Supreme Charity of the World, because he makes the point in that chapter that you can never see the target a man aims at, just the target that they hit. In other words, we judge people by their actions, not their intentions. But we want everyone to know our heart. No, that's not what we meant. But no one's going to take that time to do that. They're just going to look at the results and what's in it for me. So I can't help but think that maybe the solution to all of this worry is quit focusing on yourself so much. <laughs> just try to help other people. And let the chips fall where they may. Uh, that's the the big takeaway for me from this. And I think if you were to take an action item from this, that would kind of be the approach. He says, take action because action cures worry. Uh, the cure is to recognize the absolute uselessness of worry. But in addition to that, I think anytime you're focused on yourself, you're kind of naturally going to worry and you're going to view other things that are happening as like threats to your happiness because it's a zero sum game. And if you, uh, if you don't get the success, then it's because somebody else got it first and there's less to go around. But I think that is not true at all. Worry is a big problem and it's, it's everywhere. I mean, and we talk about the American way, but it's, it's definitely international. It's, it's all over the place anymore, but don't do it. Uh, let's, let's keep moving. Cause we got a decent amount to cover here yet. Uh, the next one, I want to go over is actually the next chapter, The Greatness of Simplicity. And this this is where I started to find myself realizing that there are a lot of books and like mainstream concepts and ideals today that this predates. This is what this is what I was talking about early on. It's like the foundational change that you can see when you start realizing that some modern day pieces uh, have some older roots. And this is one of those. So the greatness of simplicity and the one particular concept I, I found myself 
like this is hitting me in the face. Like this is totally minimalism, hundred percent. And this is in 1907, and I don't think of folks in 1907 needing a concept like minimalism. Like I see that as like coming from our consumerist mindset, from our we got to have all the latest and greatest, we got to have all the things, and we got to have more toys in our neighbors, and our grass has got to be green. Like I see that mentality being the one that then leads to the exact push to the opposite of minimalism. Like. You don't need all of that. You need this simplicity. But here we are hearing about it from 1907. So <laughs> obviously there, there's a couple things going on, I would think. One is this problem has been going on longer than we thought it was. Or our sense of what simple is has changed drastically. Because I would bet that even in an even in an extreme minimalist home today that's probably quite extravagant and has tons of extras over what that would mean in 1907 like you get what i mean like that yeah. that baseline is probably significantly different you know becky and i joke about this a lot like people were just built tougher back then like, like <laughs> we can go out in 5 degree weather but I'm not gonna go out there for multiple days in that. And people did Joshua that. Joshua Becker <laughs> Joshua Becker would not be a minimalist in nineteen oh seven. No, I don't think so. But probably not. Now I, I agree with you. Uh again, the next book is gonna speak to some of this. Uh but also I think it's interesting how the framing of minimalism and simplicity has changed. Because remember, this is all through the perspective of self-control. So don't go chase everything you want. Don't get everything you want. <laughs> Keep things simple. As opposed to, I feel like minimalism today is almost an aesthetic or a fad. That's the wrong term for it. And I know some people um, who embrace this philosophy and they, they don't just have 66 items of of clothing or whatever but i, I feel like there is it, it's hot right now uh, it's almost a bad the of whole honor. idea exactly and people kind of have this picture in their head of what a minimalist home looks like very neutral tones lots of white a couple of plants nothing else in the living room and that's not necessarily true and even the minimalist would say that's not necessarily true but i think nowadays there is this kind of inherent pressure to conform to something like that because everyone feels the pressure of being so busy and having so much to maintain Almost everyone is familiar, at least, with that feeling, even if they don't take the time to identify the source of it and move towards this simplicity. But I think the default move towards simplicity can be get rid of all the things that don't spark joy, sell all the books, <laughs> you know. And and I think that is a very American approach to it, <laughs> As a, instead of. Assuming responsibility, oh, I've collected too much things, it's, well, no, I just need to try this system, and that's going to produce the happiness that I'm after. I'm not sure I'm doing a great job of explaining this, but do you get what I'm trying to say here? Yeah, it's it's essentially more than cutting back on things. It's cutting back on like some of the mindset side, too. Like That's, that's it's kind not... of what I'm hearing. Yeah, it's it's not a self-control me issue to be dealt with because I don't want to dig too deep. That's going to be scary. It's just I haven't found the right methodology, the right aesthetic. And once I do that, then it's going to provide the peace that I'm after. It's an external source of peace that we're trying to get instead of looking internally and resolving the conflict there. This might go back to John Acuff's soundtracks with the switches versus the dials. Like you have this concept of minimalism or in this case simplicity but like you're saying people are searching for that thing that they can flip the switch and that's what's going to make me happy and that's what's going to solve 
my productivity problems and that's going to keep me focused and that's the thing that's going to keep me motivated to where I don't have to actually work every day and it'll all just be fun like that's what we're searching for but that's not like that's not a switch like you got to find yeah. the different dials to tune as opposed to just you know go turn that one thing on or off I think that's and I guess I'm thinking specifically of like Joshua Becker with the minimalist home, because at the end of each one of those chapters that we covered, there's very specific action items as you take it room by room. Yep. And the end result is you've gone through your entire dwelling and you've gotten rid of a lot of clutter and you feel a lot better about your situation, but it's a lot easier to package just follow along with me as we go through every closet and we deal with the things in there as opposed to look into your soul and see what's really there. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> Cause it's a desire for more stuff and to keep up with the Joneses. Yes. But we like things. Things are fun. Just true. See how many things your kids want for Christmas. That'll answer that question. All right. The next chapter here, I put this in because I work at a church, so I hear this stuff a lot. But syndicating our sorrows, I'm skipping over one chapter called Living Life Over Again, but syndicating our sorrows, if I had to summarize this in one sentence, it would be sharing our woes with others. This is one of those yep. negative chapters, like don't do this scenarios. <laughs> so, Yeah, the sentence I wrote down is the most selfish man is the one who is unselfish with his sorrows. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and it's so true. It's, it's very common for me at a church to hear people, for lack of better terms, whine and complain about things. It happens a lot, and... Sometimes we need to hear those sorrows. Like we need to hear those woes because it's I've got a family member that's being cruel to me and we could potentially help in that. Like that's that's one side of it. I don't feel like that's what he's talking about here. He's he's talking about oh, I really don't like the way that Jane did that. That service was just way too long. Like that sort of thing. Like <laughs> Sure, maybe you have qualms with it. Go talk to Jane about it. You don't need to tell me about it. Like, I probably have my own opinions, but I'm probably not going to share them with you. So <laughs> that's just the way it is. But that's, I think, what he's getting at is here. You don't have to syndicate those, which I found it interesting he used that term. It's kind of interesting mm -hmm. where that's come in over, over the decades and century now. But yes, don't share those. <laughs> you don't need to do that. I think of like an RSS feed. That's just my gripes and opinions yes. about all the things that are going wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm not sh exactly sure that's what he is saying here, by the way. And you got to be careful with this because you really can't apply this to other people. You just got to do it yourself. Mm -hmm. I feel if you're going to apply anything from this, because there are situations where people just need to, share stuff they haven't told anybody and the very best thing you can do for those people is just shut up and listen but there are other times when people are just used to sharing everything that's going wrong in their life and they want someone to empathize with them and be like oh you poor thing it's okay and uh, depending on where they happen to be at that could be the right message or it could be the wrong message. Sometimes people need a, a kick in the butt and you know what? Maybe if you actually started doing the right things, you'd get right results. Uh, maybe you should quit whining about all these bad things that are happen to you, happening to you because you find yourself in the wrong place at the wrong time and just look at the people that you're hanging out with. <laughs> uh, that's a, a extreme example maybe, but I think there's two sides to approach this from. And the big takeaway for me from this chapter is this phrase, we should seek to make life brighter for others. So in terms of me and how am I going to apply anything from this chapter, I don't have, I don't think I have any action items from this book, by the way, but uh, this 
kind of spurs in me a general approach of the things that I'm going to be sharing. Are they going to help other people or are they going to, uh, I guess the opposite of that in terms of syndicating your sorrow would be the belief that by me venting this, I will feel better. I, it'll help me. But I don't even think that's entirely true. I don't think that is helpful when you just vent negative on whatever platform you happen to have, whether it's calling up your friend so you can gossip about something or writing a negative post about somebody on, on Facebook. Uh, I want to put off the type of energy that I would like to attract. And, and I do think that there is some reciprocity there. If you are consistently positive, you will kind of attract other people who are consistently positive. If you are consistently negative, you're going to find yourself around people who are consistently negative. And then going back to chapter two or whatever it was, you know, what is the effect of all this positivity or all of this negativity? Is it taking you where you want to go or is it not helping you in any way, shape or form? If it's not helping you in any way, shape or form, then get rid of that. Do the other thing. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, we have no right to syndicate our sorrows, he says. And I think for the majority of, of situations, that is absolutely true. Yes. But like you're saying, like there are times when, someone's going through something difficult and they need to talk through it. But I don't think that's necessarily what he's talking about here. Maybe that's just my no, perspective that's, on it. That's a, it's almost like a confiding in somebody. I got to yes. tell someone as opposed to syndicating. I got to tell everyone. Correct. <laughs> yes. That one-to-one -one versus one-to-many scenario I yep. think is important. The next chapter here is Revelations of Reserve Powers, which we're going to skip over, but think of a reserve power as an emergency fund. You got to read the book. And then following that is The Majesty of Calmness. And there's only one thing I wanted to just kind of ask here. Did do you feel like this was the meditation mindfulness world from 1907? I mean, obviously meditation's been around for ever. And this had very strong airs of that to me, but I was curious your perspective on it because it seems like every time we come across something that says something along the lines of meditation, you want to try it again. So I just wanted to know <laughs> <laughs> if this did that for you. Uh, there's definitely some overlap. I don't know if it was this chapter specifically, but yeah, meditation is not a new idea, just happens to be a pretty popular genre of app store <laughs> apps. Yeah, for sure. Uh, I like the definition of calmness that he has here, which is signal singleness of purpose, absolute confidence and conscious power. I don't think those necessarily line up with the whole idea of meditation. They don't necessarily work against it either, but I think calmness goes beyond meditation. So I can, right now, as I record this podcast, have singleness of purpose, absolute confidence, and conscious power, or I can be stressed out because I wasn't able to disconnect from the craziness of the day that was before we hit the record button. Yeah. Right? So again, I think you can apply this to a lot of different areas in your life, but meditation would be one of those, and it would be a good practice and is a good practice that I'm trying to make consistent. <laughs> it works and it doesn't. It comes and it goes. Eventually, one of these days, I do believe it's going to stick. Uh, I'm not giving up on it, but <laughs> haven't haven't made it a habit yet. So. Sure, sure. No, I was I was just curious if you did because like the way I took it was the whole being calm. There's two ways I took it. One is going back to the Ryan Holiday stillness is key reacting to things with sound judgment like that that concept is one that it struck me with the calm way of reacting to things and the other was putting yourself in a calm scenario which i try to make sure i do somewhere around twice a day by going out in the woods and such i have that luxury now so i'm, I'm thrilled to be able to do that this morning i did not it was five degrees when i got up this morning <laughs> and wind was whipping and it was negative 15 wind chill it's like nope i i'll let the dog out and watch from the window <laughs> that's as far as i got so i need to get some warmer clothes for something like that if i'm gonna do that 
multiple coats. <laughs> so if I could jump in here real quick, uh, I'm kind of curious. You're talking about two different kinds of yes of calm here, one which is internal, and then one which is external. And I 100% agree. You should seek to create an external environment that is as calm as possible. The, different people have different degrees to which that is possible. But one of the things I wrote down in my mind note file in this chapter is that calmness as he's talking about it comes from within. So where do you draw the line there, <laughs> I guess? Because you're talking about getting out for your walk, creating some external circumstances, but are there ways that you apply this in the middle of all the craziness when stuff is just bouncing off the walls that you just find a moment and this is what I do to recenter? Yeah, it's it's both and. So the former of those two, seeking it internally, like to me that's where the potential overlap for meditation comes in. The external yep. of going out in the woods, to me, induces the former. So going out to the external circumstances, the nature, the walks outside, unless I bring all of the kids and they're just super excited and talking about all of the different things they see out there, it's very, very calm whenever I'm able to make those journeys. And it helps induce the internal. So I think you're right. I think he does specifically call out like this is an internal thing. But I'm referring to the external because it helps, at least in my case, it helps bring about that internal. It does. Uh, I think in terms of painting a picture for what calmness is and what you're trying to achieve, though, uh, my pastor has this saying, be a thermostat, not a thermometer. And I like that because the thermometer simply takes the temperature, but the thermostat controls the temperature. So you can either be affected by your surroundings or you can affect your surroundings. And when you have true calmness, it overrides the external circumstances. Yes, I like that, the whole thermostat thermometer thing. Because you can take that, like my brain immediately went to all sorts of places when you said like, okay, well, yeah, the thermostat does control the temperature, but indirectly, and only if it has fuel in it. Like in the system. Like <laughs> That's true. If you That's don't true. have a gas line or electric or something, that thermostat doesn't do anything. So if you have no fuel in the system, it's worthless. <laughs> so, yep. But yes, and most thermostats have a clock on them too. There's that. All sorts of stuff. You, I, my brain went all <laughs> sorts of places there. All right. So the majesty of calmness. Let's, let's go into another problem with America, shall we? Hurry. The scourge of America, he says this time. So we have worry, the great American disease, and now we have hurry, the scourge of America. There's a couple quotes I wrote down from this one, Mike. Uh, one is, nature never hurries. Yep, I figured you'd write that one yep. down. <laughs> Which I kind of had qualms with because I'm like, I, I, squirrels run around all the time trying to collect as many nuts as they Like, they definitely hurry. Like, <laughs> right? I, but anyway, there was that. And then the other one was, let us not be impatient which was towards the end of that chapter. And, you know, it, there's there's so many things, that you, so many places you could take this. Like we, we buy toys that then take upkeep, and it means that we have to do things to keep us busy constantly. The whole busy, I'm in a rush, there's too much going on. Like these are all self-inflicted. I just had a conversation with a, a, a service provider of ours here at the church, I don't know, 30 minutes before we got on the podcast here about, you know, there's a lot going on. This is one of my busiest times of year uh, at the church. And he said something about, you know, don't you wish you had more time in the day? And it's like, well, if I had 48 hours in a day, I would just fill it up the same way I've got my 24 filled up. So it would be the same <laughs> feeling regardless. So it's just the way it would be. So it's self-inflicted. Yep. We definitely do this to ourselves. But at the same time, I, I'm also aware that if you go the opposite side where you cut so much stuff out that you don't have a lot going on, you get to boredom, which then I feel like, you know, as Brett McKay has recently said on The Art of Manliness, like that can kind of come to uh, burnout. Like we tend to think of burnout as I've got too much going on for too long, but really that has more to do with boredom and motivation. 
than anything. So I feel like we're kind of floating around that whole concept in this chapter uh, with William here. So I, I think it's definitely true. We definitely, as Americans, hurry constantly. But this is also 1907. Yep. I feel like things are way more high-paced now than they were in 1907. And Oh, if, for sure. If for they sure. were considered fast and people were talking about hurrying all the time in 1907... They would think we're a crazy group today if they saw what we do. But well, yes. what would you say is the motivation for hurrying? Probably being left behind or some of the fear of missing out is probably there, the FOMO. If you feel like you need to hurry in your day, why is that? Probably because you've got more things you need to do and you recognize you're not going to get them done in the time that you have available. Or you haven't pared back the list of things you feel you should do or want to do or haven't narrowed it down to the things you feel called to do. So it's outcome driven though, right? Mm -hmm. It's based on these things that I feel like I should do, have to do, whatever, right? Which is a theme to be continued in our next book. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't realize this was a precursor at all. <laughs> yeah. So you probably didn't uh, realize you were picking a sequel. <laughs> <laughs> I did not. I did not. But I, I see the, the overlap here. Um, a couple other quotes I'll add from this, this section. I, I just want to plant that, that seed because I have a feeling as you're reading the next book, this is going to come up again. But... Um, Hurry seeks to make energy a substitute for a clearly defined plan. That gets at some of the things that you were talking about. If you have a clearly defined plan, a realistic plan, you know enough information not to pick more things for your to-do list than you can actually do, then you won't feel like you need to hurry. However, that's not the only source of hurry. So I think that's a fairly limited definition. Uh, the other thing here is that every he says everything that is great in life is the product of slow growth. I tend to agree with that. <laughs> I don't think that's what America wants. Uh, we're a microwave society. We want instant gratification. But I don't agree with that. <laughs> I very much more align with that particular statement, which again, 1907, so our culture is very different than it was back then. Although the source of the frustration, it sounds like is not all that much different. It's right. just the, the ways that we try to medicate <laughs> uh, the way we try to manage our time and check off the things that we want to do uh, has evolved. But uh, the desire to constantly do more has not. Yeah, there's so many places we could take this, so many places we have taken this in the past. We're at a whole book on busy. So, I mean, there's just... Yep. Learning to pair things back and focus, that's it's so hard. And being willing to do things the slow way, like you're saying. Like, my kids always want things immediately. I want a snack now. Well, do you have the chore list done? No. Do you have the cats fed? <laughs> no. Do you have your room cleaned up? No. So you've done none of the work that's required for snack time. No. So then why would you think you get snack? Like, th this is, <laughs> <laughs> like, I don't, like, I understand you're four, so I get that, but this is the process, right? Because I don't want my kids to grow up thinking they get what they want right now all the time because that's a dangerous place to to sit and we see it all over the place right now anyway yep and so i think that's one part of this is the self-control aspect of well i need to take responsibility and do my things first before i can have my treat or, or my snack but the next book kind of also speaks to the fact that maybe you don't have as much control over the things that happen as you think you do and learning to be okay with results that are not entirely within your control. And I think a combination of those factors helps 
alleviate some of the pressure we feel to hurry and some of the symptoms of busyness. The next chapter here is called Failure as a Success. And the only reason I wrote this down is because it seems like in the world of like startups and tech companies, they talk about this a lot as like fail fast. You hear that quite a bit. Yep. And again, this is one of those, like, this was definitely a thing even over 100 years ago that was being talked about. And it's, it, it's told with the story of a group that decided to float logs down a river for the first time. Again, apparently, that was a new thing. I don't know how long ago that had happened, though. But he told the story here. <laughs> I don't remember. And it fell apart. Like they had a storm and the the whole system fell apart, but the logs, you know, went downstream and they weren't able to capture all of them. And what they ended up doing is they put out, uh, you know, they asked for people to notice them and log where they were and when they saw these logs on the rivers and oceans and all the different places. So they did that. And although it was a failure to float the logs to where they wanted them, it was a positive because they learned about all the currents and such that made up the ocean and riverways and everything. So, like, how water flows, they learned a lot because of that. But it was an unintended experiment, of course. So that's, that's what he starts this off with. Even though you have a failure... If you're willing to process that failure, if you're willing to examine it, which I'm not always willing to do, and I know you're not either, Mike, because you've told me stories, <laughs> <laughs> but if yeah. we're willing to evaluate these failures, it it can often lead to you realizing either something you've learned or it led you to a place that you didn't expect to get to. You know, I've I've had failures with you know previous jobs that have taught me something that I now use data like daily in my current job. Like these things happen, and at the time, it's painful and it's not fun, and you don't like dealing with the difficult thing. But again, if you're willing to process it, you're better off because you can usually see at some point whether it's immediate or not. I can't answer for you, but you can usually see the positive in it if you're willing to look for it. Yeah, I agree with everything that you said, which is why I think the story that he uses of Columbus is not very effective. <laughs> he says, in discovering America, Columbus failed in his original mission, which is true, but I don't think it's all that practical an example, even in 1907. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Maybe there was a limited pool of shared knowledge to draw from for that kind of thing. You know, we tend to hear the same stories over and over and over again in a lot of the books that we read. So if I say the Polger sisters, you right away are thinking of the sisters who got really good at chess because their dad was running an experiment on them. On a, yeah, he experimented on his kids and convinced his, uh, he convinced a gal to marry him with that yep. premise. Yep, exactly. Or the Pomodoro method, you know exactly what that is, 80-20 Steve Jobs. You know, there's all and Steve these. Was. Yep. Yep. So there's all these principles that are kind of the foundation of our shared knowledge when it comes to this productivity stuff. But in 1907, I can imagine that there's a much smaller pool to draw from. So maybe that's the <laughs> the reason there. But uh, also the log example that you were sharing earlier. I don't know that was kind of a cool story but it didn't really work for me with what he's really saying here i mean the whole it's right in the title of the the chapter failure as success failure and one thing often opens the door to success somewhere else i feel like that's a very effective lesson to learn but i don't think he did a real great job in this particular chapter of explaining how you would practically go about that other than i guess when you are trying to find nautical shortcuts and you find yourself on new lands don't consider it to be a failure and go explore instead i i don't know <laughs> i don't often do that so not a not a boat master <laughs> right so i i i have trouble i i have trouble thinking through 
like any sort of practical takeaway from this, because anytime there is failure, I think you can use it as a springboard. You can look for those ancillary things that weren't directly in front of you. Failure as I ran into an obstacle and now I have to kind of course correct and figure out a way around this. But it's also quite possible that you just failed because you were stupid and you made a dumb mistake. And I think the important thing is to ask why, but I don't think there is always a new and better path from every single failure. But so, if you're willing, like to go back to what I was saying earlier, but again, if you're willing, I think if you're able and open to processing that failure, you can at least learn something from it. Like no matter what it was, I would say that there's something there. But you're absolutely right. Like sometimes you're just dumb. Don't be dumb. <laughs> yeah. So I guess kind of as I read this, and maybe I missed his main point, but it kind of felt like whenever you have a failure, it's not really a failure. It's a form of a success. You just got to find the way that it is a success. And I think that's very different than figuring out why something was a failure and learning from it for next time. Sure. Yeah. No, that's a valid point. Yeah, I I definitely took it as if you look, you can find the success. But this might be a case of me taking like previous books and then putting them on top of this and just translating it that way. I tend to do that. I tend to summarize very quickly and just assume when I read these things. <laughs> so it happens. Uh, so failure is a success. And then the last chapter I wanted to cover here is the last chapter of the book. Because I feel like you have to at least cover the beginning and the end. The Royal Road to Happiness. I struggled with this one, which I was not expecting to. And it seemed like what he was saying is you can take self-control and apply it to all these areas we've talked about and then find happiness if you do that. I feel like that's what he was trying to say. But I had a really <laughs> hard time connecting it all together. Like I felt like I wanted him to wrap it up with a bow and, and hand it off, but I don't feel like he did that. And I had a really hard time nailing down what he was getting at in this chapter. I'm hoping you figured it out because maybe you've got a better perspective on it. But I felt like what he was trying to tell us was the ways that don't work to be happy. Like don't search for contentedness and because that's just not going to be the answer. Like, But I didn't feel like I got a clean answer on what he was trying to do there. Did you figure this out? Please tell me you did. Uh, I'm not going to profess to have figured it all out, but I, I, I feel like I, my takeaway from this chapter maybe is a little bit different than yours. Okay. <laughs> uh, I'll just share some of the stuff that I, I jotted down, but I definitely see the thread here with this stuff. So he mentions in this chapter, for example, that happiness defies our environment. It can grow in any soul and it can live under any conditions. He also says that what a man has depends on others. What he is depends on himself. So I feel like this is tying together a lot of the threads for me that on the open loops that he's created in these other chapters. He kind of speaks specifically to being content with a situation. Um, he says, be content with what you have, but never with who you are. Content with who you are is a form of diluted despair, which I think is a very powerful, and I like the way that he described that. If you think that who you are right now is all you will ever be, then why the heck do we read all these books? Yeah. What's the point? <laughs> it's because we believe that we can grow and improve and do a better job stewarding the resources and the time that we have available to us. He also says the basis of happiness is love of something outside of self, which is why chapter three spoke so much to me about the duty versus love. If you are just doing your duty, then you're never going to be happy. <laughs> you're just going to avoid conflict, maybe checking off the boxes, but it's not going to provide any sort of motivation or purpose for your life, which is where I think this happiness really comes from. The road to happiness specifically, he has four points, consecration, concentration, conquest, and conscience. So four C's, nice uh, alliteration there, but uh, I don't have anything else written down for those. I, I don't think that whole idea is, um, is all that, that great. I, it kind of feels like if he was going to write this book today, this is the one, the part where his editor would explode this 
into three different parts and this is your framework for the entire book. He's trying to like wrap it all up, but I didn't think that was all that practical to be honest, but it doesn't mean that there isn't a very powerful theme here, which is essentially no matter where you are, no matter what you have, you have the ability right now to connect to a purpose that is bigger than yourself and to be happy. And right at the, the last thing I wrote down from here is that unhappiness is the hunger to get happiness is the hunger to give, which I think comes back to duty versus love or even more strongly love versus lust. Ed Cole uh, has defined this. Uh, he's the guy who wrote the men's curriculum that we go through at our church. Love is the desire to benefit others at the expense of self, but lust is the desire to benefit self at the expense of others. So lust is, I got to climb the ladder. I don't care who I'm stepping on on the way up because I'm not coming back down. But love is second mountain and I'm looking to do all the good that I, I can. And that's the one that is more closer to the truth because success is not a zero sum game and there's not this limited quantity of it to go around. The fact that I'm successful doesn't mean that you can't be successful. In fact, if uh, we both embrace this, it means that we're both more likely to be successful because we're going to work with each other and we're going to learn from each other. So I, I, he didn't explicitly say this, but this is how I heard it is, you know, if, if you're going to be motivated by love, you're going to be successful. You're going to be happy. If you're going to be motivated by lust and try to get as much as you can for you and yourself, then you're going to be miserable. And I think that's actually a really great way to <laughs> end the book. That's, that's way better than the way I took it. I, maybe I just missed some of the key points in that because what you just explained makes perfect sense and wraps it up very nicely. Somehow I didn't catch that. I don't know why or how. Maybe I did I not read it? I felt like I read it. But I don't know. Sometimes I do that. I like It's your... a topical reading, going back to how to read a book. <laughs> Yes. I have a bunch of other books that have spoken to the same thing. Yep. So I'm connecting these dots in a different way than you are. Yep. It That's does all. does happen. So yeah, I I don't know. I didn't catch most of what you just explained. Uh to me, I was seeing in the back of my mind, I was seeing some of the books that we've read that talk about happiness and how it's more about succeeding in the struggle than it is with not having struggle, which is opposite of what we would normally consider. Uh, it's why I tend to refer to the the simple phrase memento mori every morning. It's like, you know, remember death, which is, of course, morbid. But whenever I recognize how bad something could be, you appreciate what you have now much more. And that's something I feel like is very vital if to this whole happiness conversation but that wasn't brought up here. So I think maybe I've just got this preconceived notion that that's, that's what needs to be in there, but it wasn't. So then how does this work? Yeah, I probably got there somehow. I'm trying to justify this to myself right now. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, that's, that's the book uh, in a nutshell. We're basically talking about how to control yourself and looking at that through a lot of these different lenses of different character traits and scenarios uh, also through the lens of 1907, which I think I've been kind of hung up on this whole time, but I think it's fascinating. Stuck on it for sure. It's true. Anyway, action items, unless there's something else you want to talk about here, Mike. Nope. Nope. Okay. Let's do it. So action items, I have one, and it's not really from any specific part of the book. It's from my own perspective of reading this, and that is I don't think I have ever done true research in trying to figure out how does self-control and ADHD go together because one of the things, at least that I'm that I always struggle with, is like ADHD in my case has to do with getting hung up between tasks and the motivation to move on to that next one and not not, I shouldn't say that, and struggling to control myself to move on to that next one, whether I want to or not. Like that little tiny time frame between tasks can quickly become six hours of not doing the thing. And I feel like I don't have any control over that, but I feel like that's not true. 
I just haven't figured out what the scenarios are and how to work through that. So I don't know how to term that as an action item, but I wrote it down as just self-control and ADHD. But I feel like it's a little bit bigger than that and a little more involved than that. But I feel like I need to do a little research because I know that there's some stuff out there around this. I've just not found it and read it yet. If you, if folks online mm-hmm. know about this stuff, please send it to me. Uh, I will definitely go through it. But I'm, I feel like I need to do some research on this because although like, I love a lot of what's in here, I'm not sure how to apply it in some cases for me. And I'm not trying to just pass it off and say, I can't do that. It's a legit struggle, at least on my side. Maybe it's not for you, Mike, but I definitely struggle with it. So I got that as an action item. All right. I think that is a very valid uh, action item because I think the truth is probably somewhere in between. If you were to talk to the author, he would say, no, just suck it up and do it. (laughs) I definitely feel like that's what he would tell me. (laughs) I've talked to enough people recently, like uh, Jesse Anderson. He was on a recent episode of, of Focused and shared a lot about ADHD versus neuro neurotypical brains and uh, I don't understand all of it but I have a better understanding after talking to him and kind of the dopamine driven motivation for a lot of the different things that get done uh, I don't have a simple answer and, and I think that's the the natural next step for this is to figure out not just how do I apply what this person is saying but what does this actually mean to me mm-hmm. that is sense making in a nutshell <laughs> <laughs> All right, there you go. Sounds like I need to go listen to your other podcast. I uh, I support your your action item. All right, thanks, Mike. What do you have? I got nothing. Good job. <laughs> <laughs> no action items. You uh, had great self control cool... <laughs> in that. <laughs> <laughs> I guess. Uh, I don't know. I feel like there's some opportunity here for action items but also the biggest takeaways for me from this book were not something new but it was kind of filling in some blanks for stuff that i've already known that sounds kind of pompous to say it that way but like we've read other books on these topics so i have like this picture where i can tell what it is like a jigsaw puzzle that's missing a bunch of pieces and so I feel like I got some more pieces by reading this, but I don't have anything that's groundbreaking or new. Like, oh, I'd never thought about that yeah. before. I should try this. Right. All right. Well, style and rating, I guess I get to go first this time. I have to say that this is a very dense book. I think I mentioned that early on. I wasn't expecting that. Uh, if you do some research on uh, William George Jordan... He's, he's mostly an essayist. He wrote a lot of essays, and this is probably what that is. Uh, this is likely what it would be called. Uh, it's short enough that it could be that. I think somebody in the chat said their version was 70 pages long. I think it depends on font size and page size and stuff. But I can't say that I've run across something quite as cornerstone as something like this, because so much of what we talk about in self-help, in productivity, can come back to self-control. Because if you don't have that, then it doesn't matter what you put on your calendar. It doesn't matter what you put in your task manager. You're not going to follow it anyway. So what's the point? Like, So much of it comes back to this. And like you were saying, there are a lot of books that we have covered in the past that talk and speak to these particular topics in more depth. And at the same time, like you said early on, Mike, older books like this tend to just have a very different take on it because it is almost just a, it's a brand new idea in some cases, in a lot of cases, because it hasn't been widely written about. You know, if you want to read a book on habit making, like, how many have we covered for bookworm? Like, and that's just one topic. But if you had a book from the early 1900s on habits, like I'm all over that because it wasn't a popular topic at the time, and it would be kind of a fresh view on it. 
I feel like this is the same way. We've talked about a lot of this, but it's still very fresh, and I guess I should say just refreshing to read it uh, because of that different take on it. I did struggle with the very end of it. I wish I hadn't because I was so ready to give this a five-star rating, but then I struggled right at the end, and maybe I'll reread it, and maybe we do a book re-rating thing at some point, and I'll change my opinion, but I think I'm going to put it at a 4.5 just because... I felt like it didn't get wrapped up well enough for me. Like, I really struggled on that last piece, which is kind of an important one, I felt like. But so much of it I love that I really I really wanted it to get there, and maybe it should be. But I just felt like it didn't quite make it because of that ending piece. All that said, definitely going to recommend this one. You know, even in my circles in, you know, real life, as we're calling it, I feel like this is one I'll probably mention quite a few times for sure. All right. Well, I thoroughly enjoyed this book. I really enjoyed the style. I'm not sure what that says about me. <laughs> <laughs> I felt like he was just very direct in how he was communicating and also I I feel a lot of times when I read these older books that people were smarter back then. Do you ever feel that way? I always feel like folks from that time period are, I, I don't want to say more intelligent, but more, definitely they more sound intentional. More intelligent. Like definitely more intentional. Yeah. And they, they tended to think about things differently, but I think that's, I have so many reasons for explaining why that is, but there's something about it, yes. I, I'm with you. There's something very different about it. The language, while it's not too... Uh, it's, it doesn't feel like a textbook. It's not something where I have trouble grasping what they're saying. But just the cadence and the word choice and everything just feels much more intentional as a good word. There's nothing wasted here traditional advice it seems for a lot of people who are writing books today is start with a really dramatic story from your life and then talk about how you discovered a solution and spend the next 50,000 words expounding on that solution and especially that first part where they're they're describing their own situation it feels a lot of times they they manufacture a bunch of words uh, in order to create a, a stronger effect at which doesn't always work. And this is very short. I don't even know how many words this is, but it would probably not even be considered a, a book now. Like it would be way too short to traditionally publish. But I think that lends itself well to the, the content. Um, I don't think it's one of the best books I've ever read. And I hesitate to say that I'll recommend this one to a bunch of people. I do think it's very appropriate for the right people, but I feel just in the title, you have to have someone who's on board with the idea of taking responsibility for their life already. There's no sugarcoating this. No. It's right from the beginning. Where you are is your own dang fault. Yep. And so... If you're uncomfortable with that, you're not going to connect to anything that that he's saying here. I also think some of this stuff, I agree with the core principle that he's driving at, but some of the way this, that he worded some of these things, I wasn't a huge fan of. Uh, we talked about a couple of them, like a calmness, you know, being two different definitions there. It could be something that comes from within or it could be your environment. And I feel like it's a lot more complicated than how simply he articulates it in these very short chapters, which isn't necessarily a bad thing, but if you're really trying to dig into some of these issues and, and get to the, the truth of them, simplicity would be another one, you know, worry, hurry, all that kind of stuff. There's a lot more to be said in this conversation. I feel like 
if this is the only thing you read and this is your starting point towards these things, you've got different ends of the spectrum. He is definitely skewed way towards one end of the spectrum. And so uh, one of the things that Nick Milo talks about is triangulation. So I've got this data point over here. I can collect a whole bunch of other data points from other voices in the echo chamber, which are all going to support that. Or I could go the other way and listen to the opposite end and realize that the truth is probably somewhere in the middle. I feel like that's necessary when you read this book. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to rate it 4.0. And I do think it's a, it's a good book. And I really enjoyed specifically the chapter on the Red Tape of Duty. If that was the only chapter I read, it was still a worthwhile read. Uh, but I think in order to get to the real meat of some of the issues and the questions that he's raising in this book, you need something outside of this book in order to really get a benefit from it. Maybe that's a little bit of the issue you experienced with that last chapter is it's not an all encompassing. This is everything on the topic, Sure. which we both know from how to read a book that's impossible anyways, but it feels like a lot of books try to be that yeah. this one does not at all. And so if you go into it thinking this is going to be like a lot of the other books that I read, you might be very disappointed. <laughs> Do you think that's maybe some of the difference between now and then? You're talking about like older writers, right? The the from a hundred years ago or more, and how they seem more intelligent. I wonder if it's because in today's books we have a tendency to have books that will try to be the one book you're gonna read. Like people don't read as much as they used to, right? So yeah. I wonder if there's a different writing style that is people are going to read one book a year. So this book has to cover a lot, a whole set of top, a topic in order to be read by that person for that one year. Whereas it used to be people shared books and they read every book they could get a hold of because they were so valuable. So people were actually more well read, I would say, than they are now. Might be wrong. I don't know. That's my perception. But if people are more well read, something like this would would by nature have less need to be all encompassing because the assumption is you've read a lot of other things. In this case, he's assuming yep. you've read the Bible many times. Uh, you can tell mm -hmm. that. But I, I wonder if that's some of the difference. I don't know that that's true. It's just a speculation. I think that's a factor for sure. Also, also remember that he is an essayist, right? Yes. So he's, when I hear essay, I'm thinking short essay, not long novel. Yep. <laughs> so if you combine those two things that he's writing, probably these individual chapters as essays to spur conversation amongst the other things that are being circulated, people are talking about that makes a ton of sense. I do think that you're right. Most people are not going to just pick up and read a book for the collection of ideas. I will. Yeah. <laughs> Which is why I like right. nonfiction books. Uh, because even if I completely disagree with it, more data points. But most people aren't going to do that. They're going to wait until something is so frustrating that they want a solution to a specific problem, which then makes sense that people are writing books as systems and just do these three things and all your problems will go away. Yep. All right. So we got a 4.5 and a 4.0. I'm ready to shelf it, Mike. You keep talking about this book that follows up to this one. What is it? It is 4,000 Weeks by Oliver Berkman. And uh, the subtitle is, I don't have it in front of me, but it's something like Time Management for Mere Mortals. If you remember the previous Oliver Berkman book that we did, we uh, he brought up the idea of, of the memento mori. I think that's the first time we encountered that Possibly, idea. Yeah. Someday you are going to die. <laughs> yep. So if someday you are going to die and the number of projects that you complete by then is worthless, how does that affect your productivity? <laughs> <laughs> yep that's what we will be talking about next time yep
And I'm shocked that you picked this. Like, this was one that I was on the edge of picking. And then you did this. Like, really? Okay. All right. Let's let's see how that... So, I'm very... You got me... Su- I'm, I'm starting this tonight. I might be kicking the bit, kids to bed early tonight. Uh, following 4,000 weeks, uh, since we're into this whole systems thing at the moment, I, I felt like I needed to choose this. I've had this in the back of my head... Uh, for a while, and then I was glancing through the Bookworm Club recommendations list, and I saw where uh, Alex had recommended this back in May. Uh, but Thinking in Systems, this is a primer by Danella Meadows. I think that's how you say it. And this one is its kind of a, an introduction to systems thinking, but I, I've the reading I've done on it is that this is definitely considered one that is the go-to, one of the go-tos for learning about systems thinking. And you and I both tend to think in systems, thus I felt like this one is probably a good one to get uh, some conversation going. So we're either going to love this one or hate it. I'm I'm pretty sure it's going to be in one of those two categories. I don't think there's going to be a middle ground <laughs> on this one, Mike. All right. So there's that. Uh, Gap books. What you got, Mike? I have Simple Numbers 2.0 by Greg Crabtree, which is basically about business numbers uh, from the perspective of startups, I guess. And it's interesting because in the startup world, it, it seems to be the primary reason that you run a business is that you are building it in order to sell it. And so he right at the beginning of this book talks about that as one of the options, but not the only option to building a valuable business with the possibility of maybe you just enjoy working in this business. And so that's perfectly fine. Here's here's how you do it uh, regularly and and systematically. So uh, this is one of the areas that I want to grow in over the next year is just kind of understanding business financials and accounting. I feel like there's a lot of very, uh, once you understand them, logical reasons for why things grow or why they don't. Uh, and until you really dig into it, you kind of feel like I do at the moment, which is things just kind of magically align or they don't. Yep. <laughs> so this is uh, Mike's attempt to uh, grow up business-wise. That's an interesting book. I may have to grab that one. That That sounds fascinating to me. Anyway, uh, as far as gap books, I'm still in the middle of Take Back Your Family. I mentioned that one last time. It's by Jefferson Bethke. Uh, It's a, I should say, it's a Christian's take on the whole busy world. And I I can see why a number of my local friends have said, you got to read this. So, yes, I'm still in the middle of it. I haven't quite figured out what I'm going to do once I'm done with it. I haven't done a gap book in so long that I need to do something, like throw a party of some kind. So anyway, Take Back Your Family <laughs> by Jefferson Bethke. Uh, I mentioned earlier that uh, Thinking in Systems was one that was on the uh, recommendations list. If you have a recommendation that you would like us to cover, go to club.bookworm.fm, and you'll see a list of recommendations there. Set up an account, and you can post a new book in that category, and we'll see it. And it Self ranks, you can vote on them. We definitely do look at that. I should probably update the ones that we've already read now that I'm saying that. But the other thing that you can do when you get to that club is join it uh, and get a membership there. It's a paid membership. It's five dollars a month, and or sixty a year if you'd rather do it that way. And when you do that, you not only get our undying gratitude because you help us keep this show going. But you also get an awesome background. Had my mind just blinked. You get a desktop background that Mike put together, which is pretty slick, to be honest. Uh, you get some old Gap Book episodes that I did. They're like some short form podcasts that are exclusive to Bookworm members. Uh, but especially, like, there's all of Mike's Mind Node files and all of the notes that he takes there as well. I've never figured out how to share mine. Mine are just weird. So at some point, I'll try to figure that out, but not now. So anyway, you get all of Mike's mind node files. All of this to say, like the membership to me is well worth that $5, not only for all the things, but because 
you get to be an awesome person if you do that. So thank you for those of you who do that. Uh, and we would love to have you on board if you're not. Yes, thank you to all the awesome persons. <laughs> all right, if you are reading along with us, then pick up 4,000 Weeks by Oliver Berkman, and we'll talk to you in a couple of weeks. Well done, sir. You as well. It's a fun one. Yeah, it wasn't too long. Not too shabby. Okay. Well, yeah. Thanks to everybody who joined us live. Hi, team. I don't know who Indeed. else here. I've tried to keep up with it, but Blake was here and had to leave. He had to go cut it down a tree in the mountains. <laughs> Super fun. Should have called that out. <laughs> Don't cut down the 30 Good quarter. luck to Blake for while he's cutting down trees. <laughs> yup, yup, yup. Well, mm. that all said, is there anything you want to tell the world before we go? I do not think so. Thanks, world. Cool. Oh, hi, Carol. Bye, Carol. <laughs> Welcome and adios. <laughs> All right. Bye, team. We'll catch you another time.